we are in a sermon series where we're studying what is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And we look, are looking at how Jesus really flipped the script. That those who want to come under his rule, his leadership, uh, want to follow him, are going to have to learn to live in an upside-down value system from the values of this world. So we started this series two weeks ago where we learned that Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we saw that Jesus wasn't talking about just any kind of poor, but completely destitute with no resources. Someone that's put in a position where they come empty-handed and they're just begging begging for mercy, begging for help. And he wasn't talking about just any kind of mourning, but the kind of mourning that we would experience with the death of a loved one. That, that God wants us to come to a place where we're the, we are at the end of our, sor- our resources, we're at the end of ourselves, where we hit rock bottom and find that he's the rock at the bottom that we can build our lives upon, that we have nothing in and of ourselves to offer to God. That in and of ourselves, we cannot work our way to heaven. We cannot work our way to God. That Christianity is completely different from every other religion in the world that says you have to earn your way to heaven. Rather, we come understanding we have nothing to offer to God that is pleasing in His sight, in and of ourselves, that it's only by His life coming and entering into our spirit that we can offer anything that's acceptable to God. And so we come desperate, and we come mourning, saying, God, I, I'm tired of my sin and who I am in and of myself. Would you save me? You know, Jesus, his name, by definition, means Savior. And, and he's got to get us lost before he can get us saved. And so as John Rittenbaugh says, he reminds us that this, these dispositions, these attitudes of the heart of being poor and mourning, they come as a result of having a revelation of seeing clearly how rich God is in terms of his love, in terms of his generosity, in terms of his kindness and mercy and wisdom and how poor we are in comparison to him. You see, where people think they're good and they're okay and are on their way to heaven and surely if I were to die today, God would see that I'm a good person and everything's okay, is that we are just comparing our goodness to other people's goodness. And when I compare my goodness to other people's goodness, I can always find one person that's not living up to my abilities and feel okay about myself. But when I go to Jesus' standard of goodness, that he would say, love your enemy and bless them and do good to them and pray for them, I know that if I were to try to do that even, it would be a farce in my heart. In my heart of hearts, I don't want what's good for them. I want them to suffer the way they've made me suffer. I don't want to bless them. I don't want to pray for them. That's not natural to any of us. But that's natural to God. That's his character. That's his impulse, is goodness and love and blessing, even to those who are not for him, but those who are against them. And he says, I want you to be like me, and the only way you can be like me is you've got to come to the end of yourself and realize you can't do it. And you've got to fall desperately on Jesus Christ and allow his life to come in you. It's only his spirit in you that could produce that kind of heart for your enemies. That kind of goodness in you. And so Jesus tells us, blessed are those who are poor in spirit and those who would mourn over their condition because they're going to find Jesus' sufficiency. They're going to put their confidence in him and stop putting their confidence in themselves. And this word that he used for for bless, it's this word in the Greek, makarios, which, which means fortunate. Man, fortunate are these, to be envied are these who come to the end of themselves and stop putting their confidence in themselves, but put their confidence in Christ. They're the ones to be envied. They're the fortunate ones. They're the ones to be commended and patted on the back and say, hey, congratulations, you've realized you've got nothing to offer God. I envy you. 
Because these are the partakers of the divine nature. These are the ones that are participating in the life of God. There's no room for pride here. Just as the physical heart has a receiving end, and as a result of receiving uh, blood, it's able to then give it away to other parts of the body, so the spiritual center of man called the heart in the Bible, it needs a receiving end in order to have a giving ability. And apart from Jesus, we're all clogged. We all have clogged, clogged arteries, unable to produce the will of God. Because we can't receive from heaven apart from Jesus Christ and his intervention. But when we open ourselves up to Jesus and his forgiveness and his power and his saving grace, now we become unclogged and we get a hearing from heaven and we're able to receive and then give what we freely received. But it's only by his grace, his life, his intervention. That's why Jesus said, you've got to be born again from above. This is not a natural thing. This is a supernatural intervention that any person can be saved and given eternal life. That leads us to the next upside-down state of being that Jesus says will define those who are allowing him to have his way in their life, his rule, his leadership in their life. In Matthew 5, 5, we read this. Blessed are the meek, Fortunate to be envied, to be commended are those who are meek, for they will inherit the earth. You want to own the whole earth? Here's how you do it become meek. See, it's upside down, it's completely contrary to what the world says. Meek people are weak people. I don't want to be meek. Meek people are doormats, they're spineless, they're ineffective. That's how the world thinks. You got to throw your weight around. You got to let people know that if they mess with you, they're messing with the wrong person. <laughs> They'll never make that mistake again. What do you mean, Jesus? Blessed are the meek. They're going to inherit the earth. They're going to inherit abuse. That's what they're going to inherit. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. You know the biblical definition of meekness? It's not weakness as the world would think of it. It's power brought under control. Power brought under control. It's the picture of a wild stallion that has not been broken, that's brought under the reins of a master. It's this idea of Jesus getting, having an ability, having an invitation, having a person come under him and say, Lord, I want you to lead me. I want you to drive me. I want you to restrain me. I want you to take me under your control so that I'm no longer just operating in the impulses of my own flesh that the power that I have is used for your glory and your honor as a reflection of your name. So, so meekness is not weakness. It's, it's that you become powerful under the control of the master, Jesus Christ. So while the world system says to assert your will on others, to throw your weight around to get what you want, Jesus Christ declares the opposite. He says, if you don't learn to surrender your will for God's will and let him throw his weight around, you won't ultimately get what you want or Christ wants. See, part of being fortunate and to be envied is the end result of a life lived in a certain way that honors God. And the life that's lived in a certain way to honor God, you might get all the treasures of this earth in this life, but what good is it to lose your soul? And Jesus says, if you will give me your soul and you will let me shape your heart into meekness, you'll inherit the whole earth that will never fade or spoil for all of eternity. All the riches of this world will be handed to you, the meek. And what I love about this passage of meekness, and you know, I must really have needed it myself because God gave me two weeks to think about this stuff and meditate on it, and like, you really need this. I got a lift last week that really gets you to think about this. You don't have to self-promote. You don't have to prop yourself up. 
and force your way and force your will or, or out of fear that you're not going to be noticed, out of fear that you're going to be overlooked. You don't have to defend yourself anymore and fight against those who come against you and lose sleep and lose peace in your heart because you have to fight for yourself. Rather, what meekness is, the, the way we become meek, meek is we learn to rest in his sufficiency. That we have a Father in heaven who will fight our battles for us, who will vindicate us, who will help us, who we can entrust with different situations that are beyond our control, that if we will cast it off of us and onto him, he can handle it way better than we can. And we can have peace when we cast our cares onto him off of us and get that weight off of us onto him. His shoulders are much bigger and much more able to handle it than we are. See, if you have God's approval, a title from man anymore to make you feel significant, you've got the ultimate title, your royalty in God's house. So you can stop chasing titles and you can stop chasing self-promotion because he'll promote you every time when you're ready. And that's a great restful place to be. The word of the God declares, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know what your job description is? Delight yourself in God. Delight yourself in that relationship. You have a Father in heaven who loves you, who wants to spend time with you, who wants you to rejoice in him. Get your focus off of the people around you, off of the problems around you, onto Jesus, and let him deal with it. He says, delight yourself in me, I'll take care of everything else. Seek my kingdom and its standards. Seek first God's rule over your life and his standards of living for your life. And he says, I'll provide everything else you need. Wait on the Lord and do good for the meek inherit the earth. Jesus is quoting Psalm 37, 10 and 11 that we're going to quote at the end of this passage. Wait on him. Let him create the opportunities. Let him handle the offenses. Let him handle the things that are stressing you out and weighing you down and causing you to lose all peace in your life. And that includes vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. See, some of you say, man, if I don't take vengeance into my own hands and I don't hurt that person the way they just hurt me, well, they're just getting away with murder. It's not right. What you're saying is, oh, God can't handle this doing the right thing here. God can't convict their heart. God can't correct their heart. I've got to do God's job for him. He's not adequate to handle it. And it always causes more pain and more turmoil and more trouble. So here's my question today. Do you want to have to throw your weight around, or would you rather have God throwing his weight around for you? See, every time you choose to take it up into your own understanding, according to your knowledge, according to your strength, you, you eliminate God from the equation. He says, oh, okay, you don't want me to be a part of this? Then you go ahead and see how it goes for you handling it. You're just going to make it even worse. Not even one amen after that. Come on now. You know it's true. <laughs> I'm only 35, and I've experienced this my whole life. But every time, you put it into God's hands. Every time you cast it off of you onto him, watch him throw his weight around. Woo! I can have peace. He's handling it. I don't got to worry about it, man. I have a lot more peace than when I'm trying to handle it. It's amazing what God can do when we stop playing his job, taking his role. You know what psychologists will tell you? That people who are over-controlled because somebody's throwing their weight around and trying to force their agenda instead of resting in God and to trusting Him and His will to be done, that people who feel over-controlled, that feel they can't have their own thoughts, their own opinions, their own boundaries because somebody's always trying to violate it, they are set up for dysfunctional behavior and addiction as a way of trying to get control back. So listen, you married people and you parents and employees and employers uh, yeah in his book soaring lessons on faith hope and love learned from the psychologist chair 
we're going to learn the importance of allowing God to make us meet. William Kunt shares, one of my clients was obsessed with changing her husband. Can I get another amen? All right. <laughs> the harder she worked at getting him to change, the more he dug his heels in and refused to change. Can I get an amen? And can I just say, I'm going to read his mind, he also held resentment and did not cherish and love her the way she wanted. The paradox is that accepting someone as he actually is gives that person more freedom to change. We all need unconditional love and acceptance, a genuine love with no strings attached, and as we feel that more and more there are strings attached and we have to meet an expectation and we have to be manipulating control, the more we are going to fight and rebel against it. In other words, the more we try to control a situation, the less control we gain. It actually gets even worse. The paradox is the more we take our hands off of it and give it to God, the better the outcome. We actually get what we want the less we try to manipulate. Let's go the other way around. I don't want to just pick on wives. Another client, he says, was determined to coerce his wife to stay with him. In attempting to hold on to her against her will, he only succeeded in pushing her further away. See, the world says, throw your weight around. You got to control the situation. You got to take charge. You got to defend yourself. You got to fight for yourself because nobody else will fight for you. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, you have a Father in heaven who loves you, who cares about the situations of your life. He will intercede. He will fight for you. You don't have to lose heart. You don't have to take control. You can be meek and calm. Ah, thank you, God. Lord, I bring this to you. I can't handle it. I'm poor in spirit. I got nothing to offer here. God, in and of myself, I can't do this. But God, you can. I put my confidence, my trust, my faith in you. I cast it on to you. And God, I will just do what you tell me to do. And I will leave everything else in your hands. That's peace. That's rest. That's joy in seeing God move mountains that you can't move. He goes on to say, giving up control can be especially difficult when we have been victimized by others. When we are wronged, it isn't our place to seek revenge. Retaliating when wronged won't decrease our vulnerability. It just multiplies the pain. Whatever or whomever you may be trying to control, you got to let it go. You'll be amazed at the peace and serenity that this simple resolution will bring. Take a deep breath, everybody. Ah, take a deep breath. Be still and know that he is God. Decide today to let go and let God be in control. You know, I had a thought down these family relationships of even ad adult children whose parents, I, I've, I've talked to many, many adult children through 10 years of ministry who feel guilted and manipulated by their parents to get them to cooperate in a certain way. And they do oftentimes out of guilt, but <laughs> there's no joy in it. And it just reminded me how, how, again, Jesus is trying to help us. He says, I came like to give you life and life to the full. He's not saying that you never speak what, what's on your heart and your mind. He says you speak it under control, under his control. You speak the truth in love, and then you release it to God. In other words, instead of out of your pain, giving sarcastic quips and, and hurting others back, learn to just say, you know what? You hurt me. It hurts me that you never come and visit me. I feel neglected. It hurts me. It hurts me, wife, or it hurts me, husband, or it hurts me, child, when you talk to me like that. But what we do oftentimes, because we're not looking to Christ to come under his control in those situations, is we hurt back the way we've been hurt. We insult back the way we feel insulted. And Christ wants to take us to a new level of living, a new level of deep, intimate relationship and connection, because every time you know this is true, that you act out of the impulses of the flesh instead of coming under Christ and his control in those moments, you put up a shield and a wall of intimacy the next time, don't you? And see, 
wall after wall, layer after layer comes in, in marriages, and then marriages will often come for counsel. After five years of wall after wall after wall, it started off very thin. And they could have dealt with it in that moment, but they allowed resentment to stay because nobody was willing to get humble and meek and just be honest and just get, you know what, I shouldn't have responded the way I did. The, way I, the reason I responded the way I did is you hurt me and I didn't say it and, you know, I just, or I suppressed it in the moment and I said, it's not that big a deal and then I held on to it and then the next thing and then the next thing. <laughs> oh man, this is so true in my household sometimes. The Lord is inspiring me today, right now. I, uh, my wife sometimes, I'll, she'll, she'll get angry at me, and I'll look at her. What's, what, really, really, I mean, over that? And she's like, how many years are we going to be married before you realize the issue is not the issue? You see, that, you're right, that's not a big deal. It's that what you did 10 days ago, and then 8 days ago, and then 6 <laughs> days ago, and then 4 days ago, and it added up, and I finally let it go. And, and, you know, I can pick on her because she's in children's wing right now. But, uh, <laughs> but by the way, she does a great job. Let me, let me come back. All right. And take it for what it is. All right. Uh, meekness. It's not weakness. It's, it takes strength sometimes to be honest and share your feelings. It's a lot easier to just operate out of the flesh and just give a dagger back the way we feel hurt. It, it takes courage to, to be honest and vulnerable with your feelings. That takes strength. It's not easy. But it brings great healing and health and wholeness to our lives that God wants for all of us. I do want to use them one more illustration from my family um, to encourage you that uh, it's a process. It's a, it's a process. Courtney uh, told me she was doing a Women of the Word lesson. She was teaching for Women of the Word. And, uh, and, so, and I knew it was about offense and, and letting go of offense. And as I'm thinking about meekness, obviously meekness is, is letting go of offense. So I said, hey, could I see your notes for that? I'd like to read that. And uh, so <laughs> this is the story she told. I thought this was hilarious as I was reading it. It was a story about me. And, and so I was like, oh, man. I, uh... <laughs> I was like, wow, I got to share this with everybody and make them feel better. So she says, as I was working on this lesson about not holding on to offense, I got a call from my husband that put me to the test on this very topic. That's how God works. It's hard to be a preacher. You always get tested on what you're preaching. Uh, he tells me a bit of bad news. I don't even remember, by the way. This is what's terrible about us husbands. We, we don't even know what it is. Uh, nothing big, she said. Just one something that needed to be talked out and worked out. But then within two seconds of giving me this information, says, sorry, I have to go. I'm walking into a meeting. Uh, so I just drop bad news and they go, oh, I can't talk about it. I got to go. She says, my first thought was, of course. Why would you have any time to have a meeting with your wife? I mean, I did not even get to use 10 of my daily words on the subject, let alone my full 30,000. But then, as I hung up the phone, fully intending to allow my mind to fume for a bit, I look over and see my computer open, my book open and highlighted, and I feel as strongly as I ever have God saying to me, Take your thoughts captive now! And she capitalized it with three exclamation points. <laughs> I really put her to the test. We are, a, oh man, thank you Jesus for a patient, meek wife. So you know what I did? I honored the spirit of this lesson and started to think objectively about what he had just told me and my reaction to his quick getaway. And you know what? As I sat there thinking on these things, not fuming, I realized there might be some truth to what he just said. I actually underlined that, boldened it, and italicized it. I'm being very meek in this moment. I felt humbled, she says, by that. If I had chosen to be offended not only by the content of the call but by his actions, then I guarantee you that later that night our home would not be a place of rest because a small offense here can have a huge ripple effect over there. She says if this is where, whew, thank you, Jesus, for an awesome godly wife. If you ever think that taking offense only affects you, 
then you are very wrong. Choosing to be offended invites stress, awkwardness, unease, and divisiveness into any group it is welcomed into. And I say, preach, sister, to that. Listen, when you choose not to be meek, when you choose to be offended, when you choose not to hand it off to God, when you choose to take it in on yourself, you carry that now with you into the other relationships of your life. Don't think it's not going to affect you over here. And ironically, you're letting somebody else manipulate you now and have control over you in ways that enslaves you and makes you anti-Christ-like in your life. But if you would lay it down to God and trust him, he will vindicate. He will be your defender. He will fight for you. Trust me, he knows how to convict you when you get out of line. And by his grace, we can have peace in our marriage and peace with our kids. And man, I can just testify more because of her than me. By God's grace, over 10 years of marriage, our, our marriage truly gets better every year. It really does. And, and it's not boasting in us. It's boasting in our God who helps shape us into the people that can have peace, that can have love. And as you can see, it's not perfect. It's getting worked out. But the more we give it to him, the more he affects. He does a better job getting Courtney convicted than I do. Can I, can I tell you? And vice versa. Proverbs 19.11, a, person a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. This is why Jesus says the meek are fortunate. The meek are to be commended. They are to be envied. They've learned to relinquish control to God, knowing the outcome is not only just in the future that you're going to inherit the new heavens and the new earth that's going to last forever, but it also comes with immediate benefits as well having peace in your life, having a clear conscience in your life, the awareness of God's presence, having prayer become powerful and effective in your life. And can I just tell you, when you're a person that's under the control of Christ, generally speaking, even with the most pagan of people in your life, they respect you. They respect you a lot more than you just lashing out in anger every time you don't get your way. When they see a person under the discipline of the Holy Spirit, under his control, it breeds respect into your life. And it's just a better way to live your life. And God wants this for all of us, no matter what our natural inclination may be. Listen, if you're naturally very volatile and, and naturally very temperamental and you're naturally very gruff, this message is still for you. God wants to show off even more. His power and grace in your life, if that's your natural disposition, he can make you a new creation, a brand new person today. All you got to do is humble yourself and ask him to help you. Invite him in. Confess your sin to him and allow him to cleanse you of control. Let me close with two things. First, the words from the Apostle Peter and how he describes the perfect picture of meekness in Jesus Christ. We see in 1 Peter 2, 21, 23, and 3, 9, Christ suffered for you. He suffered for you. He's not asking you to do anything that he first didn't do for you. Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered under injustice, he made no threats in return. Instead, he fully entrusted himself to his Father in heaven. And Peter concludes with these words, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. I don't know about you, but if you've got the gift of sarcasm, that ought to preach right there. Insult for insult. Man, that's, I hate that verse. That convicts me every time. I, you know, oh man, for the grace of God, to bring us under his control. Here's the meekness. Repay, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit what? A blessing, because the meek inherit the earth. Fortunate, blessed, to be envied, to be commended, are the meek. Because, man, at the end of the day, 
they're going to inherit the new heavens and the new earth. And by the way, here and now on this earth, they're going to experience the peace of God and the joy of their salvation. Any temporary reward that comes from a smart out comment is not worth the loss of God's rewards. Are you in control of yourself? Are you meek? Would the people around you describe you this way? What would your spouse say? What would your kids say about you? What would your coworkers say? What would your boss say? You're going to stand and give an accounting for your life one day, church. We need to let the weight of conviction fall on us sometimes. We need to get poor in spirit sometimes. We need to mourn sometimes over the way we've spoken to people over the way we've handled situations in ungodly ways that have been dragged Christ's name through the mud and not been a reflection of him. You are called to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. You've got the highest calling and honor in all of life that people look to you to see what is Jesus like. We need to honor him today. We've got to love him with all of our hearts in a way that we would say, oh God, bring my tongue under your control. God, I want you to rule over my life. I, I am tired. I'm mourning. I'm coming to the end of myself. God, I, I release and surrender the control of my life. I release and surrender the control of my finance. I release and surrender the control of any title that I'm after. I'm not going to stop throwing my weight around, and I'm going to start throwing your weight around in prayer, and I'm going to cast these cares off of me onto you. And I'm going to trust you to fight my battles, and I'm going to trust you to give me the ultimate reward. I know in whom I've entrusted, Paul said, and he's going to be faithful on that day. So in these closing moments, would you stand with me and the band is going to come, but before they come, I want us to read together from Psalm 37, 7 through 11, and 27 and 28. Would you read this with me? Do not fret, when people succeed in carrying out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity, amen? Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever, for the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Are you going to be faithful, church? Amen. amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are so faithful faithful even to convict us where we need it today faithful to pick a fight with us right now and say i love you too much to let you continue to act in that way i love you too much to continue to have you talk in that way you are your own worst enemy and you're self-destructing and i'm going to take over the reins here and i want you to wrestle with me I want you to wrestle with me over this area of meekness. I want, to, I want you to wrestle with me to come to the end of yourself. You know, Israel, by definition, means one who wrestles with God. I'm going to wrestle, God, till you bless me. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. I'm going to wrestle with you, God, because I am hungry and thirsty for righteousness in my life. God, I want to be meek as you are meek. I want to be holy as you are holy. I want to be an imitator of your goodness. I want to reflect your love. The costs are high. The stakes are too high, God, for me to continue as I am. And so, God, I come empty-handed, and I believe in your sufficiency to meet me where I can't do it. Any heart in here right now that would just say, God, I surrender. I surrender. He will bless you. He will bless you by turning you from your wicked ways. He will bless you by giving him, you the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Stop fighting him. 
<laughs> relinquish control and he will make your path straight delight yourself in him and he'll give you the desires of your heart and he'll realign your heart with his heart he'll recalibrate your marriage he'll recalibrate that relationship with your kids he'll bring restitution and reconciliation he'll do more than you could ask or imagine you'll be laughing at the end of the day at the goodness of god at the glory of god to move mountains that you can't move to remove strongholds that you can't move our god is mighty to save Put your trust in him. Relinquish control. Whatever he's putting his finger on, confess your sin and let times of refreshing come and join this church family that's here to support you, to help you carry the burdens, to pray for you, to hold you accountable, to fight the good fight next to you and lift you up. Don't go another day alone. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. Thank you for speaking to us here. God, we want to respond right now with worship and gratitude for your love for us. So God, Holy Spirit, lead us in worship right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.